Christian here. Welcome to um, the, the second episode of Christian's violin ramblings. The, let's call that violin ramblings. So I made one earlier video which was all about left hand technique uh, while playing the violin without the shoulder rest. And I promised to make a video about my right hand technique or about my right hand bow hold, which looks like this which you might find strange to look at because you're probably used to seeing more of this kind of bow hold. So, why am I holding the bow like this? Did I invent holding the bow like this? No, I didn't invent it. This is what is generally called a Russian bow hold or a late Russian bow hold and then there are like different variations. And I, I don't want to get too much into the, the, the names like for this, this one is called the Franco-Belgian bow hold, the most common bow hold, and you have like variations with the fingers more spread apart or close together, or well, all kinds of variations. Let's not get bogged down by names because I want to talk more about why I chose this unorthodox bow hold. Right? It, it's it's been used for a long time, but it's quite rare nowadays. And the only reason that it's rare is because most people are being taught the other bow hold and when they become teachers of course they teach that bow hold to their students and it goes on like this but there are still some teachers around the world who teach the other bow hold and um, I think especially if you play gypsy jazz then this bow hold might be something worth considering because of a couple of big advantages so again I want to before we go on, I want to make a disclaimer. I make the same disclaimer as in the last video. Everything I say in this video about the perceived, for me, benefits of this bow hold are purely my opinion. Um, I don't claim to possess the truth about the best way of playing the violin, because I know it's a, it's a touchy subject. So I, I, I'm just telling you how I experience playing with this bow hold. Because oh, you're also gonna know, I played with both bow holds. I played for a long time with this bow hold. And then at one point I made the switch to this bow hold because I discovered some things about this bow hold which made me think that they might better serve my uh, purpose as being a gypsy jazz violin player. So let's get into it. So what is the big difference? So th there's a couple of things I want to talk about. First I want to talk about the exact way I hold the bow and the differences between my bow hold, the Russian one, and the the normal one, the Franco-Belgian one. Let's 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 call it like the normal one, which is the Franco-Belgian one, and then my bow hold is the Russian one. So the differences between my bow hold and the normal one, uh, just in practical terms, how do you hold it? Then I want to go into the mechanics of uh, my bow hold, which is a little bit different, or it's, it's a lot different actually, from the normal bow hold, and then into the two main reasons why I chose this bow hold and why I think it serves, uh, it would serve you well if you play Gypsy Jazz. But it, you can play classical with it. For instance, a couple of people that play with this bow hold are uh, Heifetz, Milstein, Elman, uh, Aaron Rosens, um, uh, Kavakos, Kavakos. I mean, there's, there's many great uh, classical violin players that play with this bow hold too. But of course, there are many more great classical players that play with the Franco-Belgian one. So it, playing like this doesn't mean that you will be a better player than if you play like this. But in the end, that comes down to practicing and studying. But there are differences between these balls. So let's first start with um, the way I hold it precisely. So uh, the, the normal way to hold the violin ball, the Franco-Belgian way, the normal way, is with this with a pinky on top of the bow, like this, right? And then you have the, the winding here, it goes across the, the first joint of your first finger, like this, then the pinky on top, and right? then your thumb is here in this little, little valley, and then uh, your other fingers, they rest on top of the bow, and then they can be farther apart or close together. Franco Belgian, it's, it feels very, stable to hold the bow like this especially without the violin this is a great way to hold the bow without the violin so my bow hold 
like this. It feels not so stable to hold without a violin, but feels more stable with the violin, and I'll explain why. So with this bow hold, there's actually only one point you have to really pay attention to. The thumb goes in the same spot, but then the winding doesn't go uh, across my first joint, but it goes across between the second joint and the third joint. It can go all the way to the third joint if you want, or the second, but it's somewhere in between and it might shift a little bit. You might go more forward and more backwards, depending on what you, what you have to do, what the music is asking for. But in general, mine is in between. So then the, the finger is lightly wrapped around the bow. That's a big difference, right? The normal bow hold is not wrapped around, but here it's wrapped around. And then the other fingers, they, they just drop on the bow. So they look straight and it looks maybe like I'm stretching them, but I'm not. I'm just dropping them on the bow and then they are stretched if you do this. Because you hold the bow like this, right? Your hand is quite tilted forward and then like this. But the funny thing is, when you hold the bow without a violin like this, it feels less stable. And that is because when you hold the bow like this, normal, there's the bow is more balanced in your hand, right? And the, the weight is more balanced while you hold the bow like this, then you don't have this counterbalance for the weight. When, you, when your hand's like this, the, the, the counterbalance for the weight, the bow is on your pinky. And that creates a problem in the beginning because your pinky won't be strong enough. So I bet you've been doing stuff like this. We call it zwiepen. In Dutch, maybe you call it sweeping or something. And then you have to make, you have to hear the sweeping sound. And that really hurts your pinky. That's really very painful. It's still painful to this day when I do this very fast. But when you first have to do this, it's really painful. But you have to train this pinky to be strong. To, to be able to counter the weight. Probably you've been doing stuff like this too. Climbing, climbing, climbing up is easy, but climbing back down is very difficult with your pinky on top. All of this to train your pinky. Now in the Russian bow hold, you don't have this counterbalance for the pinky because the pinky is kind of straight, it's like kind of hanging. And because of there is no really counterweight, it feels unstable. But the effect of it is, if you put it on the violin, all the weight of the bow will be resting on the violin. So you don't have to really press to have weight on the bow. When you have, if you hand like this, usually when you want to have more weight, you kind of press with your first finger. And when you press your first finger, your pinky is not doing anything. So you're kind of almost mimicking the Russian bow holds, where this is automatic. Right. There's already a lot of weight on the bow because your, your whole hand is on the bow or there's more of your hand on the bow and then the weight is supported on the other end by the violin and the pinky can be off of the violin. It doesn't really matter. If you do the normal bow and you put your pinky off you will immediately feel a kind of imbalance in the bow. Um, so this, this is just chapter one how to hold the bow. So I hold like this. Okay, now let's get into the mechanics. And this is one of the, the first reasons to switch or to use the Russian bow hold. The mechanics of bowing with the Russian bow hold are much easier, much simpler. And that is because you don't use your fingers to bow. And um, if you use the Franco-Belgian bow hold, there's lots of little little subtleties you can do with the fingers, they're called finger bowing, and there's many exercises, uh, right, you have stuff like, like this thing, I, I mean, I can't do it anymore, it's too long, but you, you can use your fingers to make little bowings, right, and when you switch uh, from up bow to down bow, you can use your fingers, you get these kind of things, and you have to practice a lot, there are many exercises, it can take you months, years to be a master of the finger bows, finger bowing. With the Russian bow hold, because your fingers are not really, they are like resting on the bow, and you can't really bow with the fingers. So, what do you bow with? You bow with your lower arm, and that is the only muscle I use to bow. I just move my lower arm while my fingers are resting on the bow. So, there's no more finger bowing that you have to practice, you can skip all of that. You don't have to train the pinky to be really strong because the pinky is not doing anything. It's not providing a counterweight. 
Right? It's just there. So the mechanics of bowing like this are really easy. Just move your lower arm and that's it. So then you say, well, but you know, with the finger bone you can make this really like subtle bow changes inaudible. Uh, because you work on it like inaudible bow changes. But this is a kind of an illusion because it is impossible to make inaudible bow changes. I mean, you could work on making it less audible, but the way you do that is by lifting the weight of the bow at the moment you change the bow. You can do that too with this with this bow by just releasing a little bit of, by lifting your arm a little bit. It doesn't really matter because you usually change bows when you change notes and as long as there's no like gap between the notes you're playing legato and, and accenting the notes you, if you want to accent the notes you really have to push harder so if you don't do that then your bowing your bow changes will be approximately the same as using the franco-belgian and practicing all these finger bowings so the the only uh, point where the Russian bow hold becomes a little bit unwieldy is when you're at the, the extreme frog. And then the, the Franco-Belgian makes more sense because well, there's more room for you, for you to bow. So in general when, when you play with the Russian bow you try to avoid playing at the extreme frog. You say but, but don't you need to be able to play there? Well, not really because there's so much weight on the bow with the Russian bow hold, you generally need less of the bow to produce the same sound than with the Franco-Belgian bow. You need more of the bow to produce the same sound. So you will be at the frog more often. So it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy to play like this because you want to be better at the frog, but then if you play like this, you need to be more at the frog anyway. So when you play like this, I generally don't uh, pass this point, a bow from here to there. So there's a lot of exercises here at the frog that you also don't have to really do when you play with the Russian bow hold. You could still uh, practice that and be a ma master at playing at the frog. I think Kavakos can play with this Russian bow hold at the frog really well. But if you play gypsy jazz, really there's no, no really use for it. How often are you going to be at the frog with gypsy jazz anyway? Most of the bowing will be at the top half. So it's perfect for the Russian bow hold because you get this big sound easily easy mechanics and um, you don't have to practice all this weird stuff at the, the frog. So the mechanics are much easier. Um, the sound, the, the big sound is easier to produce. So um, let's get to the reason why I think this bow hold fits Gypsy Jazz really well. And the reason is because Gypsy Jazz or Jazz in general is characterized by playing legato lines. And legato means that you play uh, notes without gaps in between them. And we just concluded that playing like this will create a deep sound with ease, which is perfect for legato. So if you play like this, the easiest uh, bowing to do is legato anyway. And because you're playing legato all the time in Gypsy Chess, or most of the time, this bow hold is perfect. Um, so that is the reason I think that for Gypsy Jazz, this bow hold is great. Good sound, or easy to get a good sound. You can get a good sound with the other bow grip, but it will take more effort. You have to spend much more time learning all the subtleties of the finger bowings and changing at the frog to um, be able to master this, this Franco-Belgian bow grip. And the Russian bow grip requires less much less time to develop. You still have to, to practice it, but it develops less time. So a few um, pointers uh, still. So tilt the bow forward and just only move your lower arm. If you, if you place the spiccato, so if you play spiccato, um, you can you can still do it by moving the lower arm. I wasn't playing the best spiccato right now. Uh, you still do it. You don't never try to do stuff with your wrist. 
So you might say, well, but when I see a player, I still see movement in the wrist and the fingers. But there's a big difference um, in moving those joints on purpose or having them move by the arm. So what I do is, is I don't lock any of my joints. So everything is relaxed except maybe for this here where I hold the ball like this, but it's still light grip. And then my arm moves and I don't lock my uh, joints, so they might move. They might move, but I'm not doing it consciously. While with the Franco Belgian bow hold, you're trying to do that on purpose. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not, I'm just moving my arm and this might move, but you know, uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not the focus. I just don't lock anything and if it moves, it moves. But it is being moved by my uh, lower arm. Another thing is also, it is much easier to train the muscles in your arm to do bowing than the muscles in your fingers. Like bigger muscles are faster and easier to train. So you will get a command over the bow faster with this bow. So why then are so many players not, or why then are so many players playing with the other bow? That, that's because, well, I told you about teachers, but there uh, is there are some advantages to the bow. For instance, playing at the frog, right? I told it, but spiccato, um, sautier, those very specialistic bowings might be easier to learn with the uh, with the Franco Belgian, and that might be true. I, I don't, I'm, I'm not really sure because here's the thing: for tips chess, you don't need to be able to do that. And if you, let's say you have to play tiger rack and you want to be, you want to be able to play the sautier, right? Then I just change the bow hold to some some other bow hold, which is great for sautier. But maybe I have to play that like three times a year, or uh, well, not more than one once every three weeks. And for all the other stuff. I have to do like legato, um, ballads, or, or even fast solos. It's so much easier to do with the Russian bow hold. Uh, just move your lower arm and still get a great sound. So that is why I think the Russian bow hold is very suitable for gypsy jazz. Now I will um, tell more about this at the workshops I'm gonna give uh, at Jungle Fest Northwest uh, in September and also at the Vintage Escape Festival in July in the UK. And then I'll have exercises. I can be more in depth about the mechanics. I can demonstrate a couple of like, techniques. And of course I can answer all your questions. So I think I'm gonna make this into a series like Christian's violin ramblings, talking about technique, but also talking about maybe other stuff that is just nice to know about the violin when you're a violin player and maybe have never thought about it. Okay, see you later.